from Ottawa to Toronto, all the way to New York City. You can see wildfire smoke, smell it, feel it. Tonight, a menacing haze blanketing millions of Canadians. It's been hard to breathe. The impacts, the risks, and the questions you have answered. Canada's interest rate hits a 22-year high. Are there more hikes to come? For people that have a very thin financial cushion, it is a very difficult medicine to swallow. And Elliot Page in his first Canadian interview since transitioning. It's been extraordinary. I, I didn't think I'd ever feel this way in my life. His journey through surviving shame to his life now as a famous trans man. There will be people who can't relate to your experience. People threaten my life on the street, and this is just me. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Smoke has a chokehold on so many Canadians tonight. It's pumping out of wildfires burning in Quebec and Ontario, seeping into major cities and tens of millions of homes in an area not at all used to it. The air is thick with pollution, and that is raising serious health concerns, not only for the most vulnerable, but for everyone. This is what that smoke spread looks like tonight. You can see huge concentrations of smoke particles cutting right through Quebec and southern Ontario, hanging over the U.S. Northeast as well. And for many, this will get worse before it gets better. And how's this for a bit of a cruel irony? Today, June 7th, is actually Clean Air Day in Canada. It's meant to highlight how important good air quality is to our health, but this year, the risks of bad air quality are front and centre. Ithil Musa shows us how people are coping. For another straight day, thick, heavy smoke wafting from wildfires continues to envelop some of Canada's biggest cities. In Canada's capital, it's become hard to bear. I thought I would just wear a mask, but it's... Uh... It's worse than I thought. Our eyes are watery all the time, and uh, it's really horrible. In places like Ottawa and Kingston, the air quality has gotten so bad, it's downright dangerous. The air quality health index in both cities hit 10 plus, or a very high risk to health. Ottawa's medical officer of health says it's led to an increase in hospital visits. Yeah, it's been hard to breathe. A lot of headaches, a lot of tiredness. These university students found refuge at their local library in Kingston, which opened its doors to locals to escape the ever-increasing haze. Health experts are urging the very young, old, and those with health conditions to stay indoors. We're seeing vulnerable people at risk, outdoor events cancelled, kids having to be kept inside at recess. But it's unavoidable when your work forces you outside. It's been much harder on the guys, a lot more sort of headaches. Uh, you got to take more breaks, more water. If this holds out for the rest of the summer, it will be a hard, slow summer. In Quebec, members of the Algonquins of Barrier Lake worked hard to protect their territory from raging fires. But the smoke pushing in forced them to leave. The fires have been contained uh, nearby. Uh, but there's still a lot uh, heavy smoke coming from those areas. Health experts say people should check Environment Canada's air quality index before venturing out to make sure it's safe to do so until things clear up. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. And obviously that smoke doesn't recognize national borders. Right now some 90 million Americans across 16 states from Texas to Vermont are under smoke alerts, but nowhere is it worse than New York, where smoke and neon have combined to create a bit of an eerie glow. Strange skies over Times Square and across the city, famous landmarks in framed thick glowing haze. From the Roosevelt Island tramway to an empty Yankee Stadium, the game canceled. Chris Reyes shows us the scene from across the Hudson River. Well, the smell is strong and the haze is thick, I'll tell you that. I am in Weehawken, New Jersey on the Hudson River and on a clear day you'd be able to see the entire Manhattan skyline behind me from the downtown core to Midtown. Sometimes you can even see uh, the Empire State Building from here all the way to the Upper West Side. But as you can see, only faint outlines 
of the buildings because of how thick the haze is. And that's been pretty much uh, the conditions all day in and around New York City. Today, New York City ranked as having the worst air quality in the world, about twice as bad as Delhi and Dubai. New York City's mayor, Eric Adams, uh, warning residents to limit all outdoor activities. He said this is unprecedented, something New Yorkers have never seen before. Uh, at some point today, uh, LaGuardia Airport had to ground flights because of the visibility. And certainly from the looks of this skyline, it's hard to tell when it's all going to clear up. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New Jersey. So here's a familiar face. Dr. Samir Gupta is here to walk us through all of this. Thank you for being here. These images yeah. uh, out of New York and other parts of Canada are pretty striking. Yeah. And as I see them, I'm curious, short, short term, what is all that smoke doing to our bodies? Lots of different things. And we know this from many studies. When people breathe in that material, particularly those tiny particles, it has all sorts of effects on the lungs. Some of those particles make their way into the bloodstream and have effects on other organs like the heart. So one thing we see is an increase in emergency room visits for things like asthma and COPD. So people who have lung conditions, they flare up. We also see more heart attacks. In some studies, we see more strokes, more clots, pulmonary embolism, more heart failure, all sorts of impacts on the lungs and the heart in particular. Because those particles are getting in there? That's right. It's what we worry about. So anytime you burn a fossil fuel or carbonaceous material like wood, you're going to get all sorts of gases that are released, but you're also going to get these tiny particles we call PM2.5, particulate matter that is 2.5 microns or smaller. They're tiny enough that when you breathe them in, they go all the way deep into the lungs, and that's how they cause the damage. And it's very carbon rich, particularly because it's burning wood. There's some studies that suggest that that carbon rich PM2.5 is even more harmful for the body. All right, Dr. Gupta, we have a lot more to ask you, and, and you'll be back in a few minutes, all right? All right. And of course, when there's smoke, there's fire. Tonight, there are about 414 wildfires burning across the country. More than half are out of control. Alison Northcott shows us some of the hardest hit places and the people faced with danger and loss. A safe arrival after a long overnight trip. More than 7,000 people from the community of Shibugamo were forced to leave to escape a dangerous fire. Réjean Law says people in neighboring communities have opened their homes to welcome evacuees. We love Ujabugamo. These kids from the Cree community of Ujabugamo are among more than 200 people staying at this college after their community was evacuated. There was smoke and some of the young people are getting sick. I'm worried about the, the infrastructure to homes, the houses that are there, because this is a place that we call home. Wildfires have burned nearly 4 million hectares across the country, forcing more than 20,000 people from their homes. The federal government says it's the worst season Canada has seen. There are hundreds of Armed Forces members now deployed. Additionally, the CAF is helping with everything from delivering food and supplies to people in Mingani, Quebec, to providing logistics support. In Quebec, dry conditions and lightning sparked a hundred fires, with more added every day, some from human activity. Rain has helped in some areas, but in others, fires are still out of control. With the uh, uh, manpower we have, we can fight about 40 fires at the same time, yeah. but we have 150 fires. That's why communities from across Canada are getting extra help from the armed forces and firefighters from other countries, including the U.S., New Zealand and France. In Nova Scotia, weather conditions and firefighting have helped control the largest wildfire in the province's history. Officials say it's no longer likely to spread. In the Northwest Territories, residents can now return to the Catlodeche First Nation, where homes and the band council office were destroyed. Yeah, it was pretty devastating um, to see, uh, but uh, it was mostly the homes that, you know, the like it was basically burned to nothing. And as they focus on rebuilding, they're still on the watch for more fires. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. CBC News senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is with us now. So, Joe, uh, looking forward, what does tomorrow hold? Yeah, Adrian, unfortunately, a couple of factors line up that could make tomorrow morning the worst air quality day yet 
for the city of Toronto and communities to the west around the Golden Horseshoe. So first of all, I want to take you back to the fire smoke dispersion map. Not only does this track uh, low level and upper level winds, but it also tracks the plumes of smoke themselves that are ejected from those source fires in Quebec. And often we see those biggest plumes coming in the afternoon during the daytime heating. That happens to line up with a slight shift in winds bringing the most dense smoke over over the city of Toronto tomorrow morning. Uh, unfortunately, that means that we're not through the worst of it yet. Eventually, Adrian, that plume of smoke will be carried southward tomorrow afternoon right back into New York. Okay, to that point, how long are we expecting this to stick around? Uh, it's really about the need for a big shift in winds and a lot of mixing. And over the weekend, we're going to see winds ease, but I think we need a big system to really mix out all of this smoke in the lower levels. That's not coming until Sunday into Monday. Then we get a big system that will bring some rain and a complete reversal in winds. That does mean we do have to wait a few more days before uh, thousands, if not millions, are breathing clean air again. Monday, it looks like. All right, Johanna Wagstaff in Vancouver, thank you. You're welcome. There's little financial relief in sight tonight for Canadians. The Bank of Canada has hiked its interest rate for the first time since January. It is now the highest it's been in decades. Today's quarter point increase brings the benchmark rate up to about 4.75%. That's the highest since May of 2001, making everything from your mortgage to your line of credit more expensive. A quarter of a percentage point might not sound like a lot, but as Nisha Patel shows us, for Canadians already stretched, the impacts could be huge. Tons of Nasir is feeling the squeeze of higher interest rates. Obviously it's hurting right now, but I'm feeling anxious, like is it going to continue for even more hikes? While he planned to pay a little more, he's still shocked by the jump in his variable rate mortgages. I thought the increase would be more gradual, I've never imagined this scenario where we're at right now. It's a harsh reality facing many Canadians. As the Bank of Canada said concerns have increased, inflation could get stuck above the 2% target. So it's raising interest rates yet again. For people that don't have savings or have a very thin financial cushion, it is a very difficult medicine to swallow. The central bank said the economy hasn't cooled enough with the job market showing surprising strength and home sales and prices heating up. There could have been a little more patience in terms of whether or not the hike. It can take 18 months for these policies to have an impact. This economist says it won't be long before many households confront much higher interest rates than they're used to. When those uh, mortgages renew, those fixed rates renew for next coming years, that's where that, that shock hits. So that's why there's so much of a lag between what happens. Though Canadian consumer spending has been strong, some may be starting to get the message. Like I used to go back to Raptors maybe like three or four times a, a year. This year I didn't even go, not even once. We didn't go uh, on our vacation, just trying to save some bucks, right? So definitely it is impacting. The Bank of Canada says it's keeping an eye on inflation to see whether even higher interest rates are necessary. Many experts say they expect the central bank to take more action, betting on another rate hike in July. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. There's been a major shakeup at CNN. The network's top executive is out after just a year in the job. Chris Licht promised to make changes to bring in more Republican viewers, but according to a recent article in The Atlantic, he lost the confidence of CNN employees after a series of missteps, including a live town hall with Donald Trump. And speaking of Trump, he is now officially running against his former running mate. Former Vice President Mike Pence launched his bid to become president. Katie Simpson now on the intensifying race to become the Republican nominee. The next president of the United States, Mike Pence! Add Mike Pence to the growing list of Republicans trying to win back the party mantle from Donald Trump. He argues what his former boss did leading up to and on January 6th should disqualify Trump from office. Anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. The former vice president's chances are slim and with endorsements like this. This morning I read that somebody said Mike Pence can be a lot like mayonnaise on toast. Gaining momentum uh, might be this. tough. 
And there's a lot of Iowa bacon, maybe even a little Tabasco sauce in that toast, too. Pence is polling in the low single digits, along with former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. A wide field helps Trump. He's already got a significant lead, and if there are more candidates, there's a greater chance of a vote split. It's alarming some in the party. Every candidate needs to understand the responsibility of getting out, and getting out quickly if it's not working. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis appears to be the only candidate with a clear shot at beating Trump. And Trump is worried. But in this moment, his biggest concern may be his legal exposure. This week, his lawyers met with the Department of Justice, a sign charges in the classified documents case might be imminent. Even so, this former attorney general says Trump can push ahead. There's no disqualification in the Constitution with respect to um, a candidate being uh, under indictment. Anytime Trump faces serious legal jeopardy, his supporters and the party establishment rally around him, making him an even stronger candidate. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Pope Francis is recovering in hospital. The Vatican says he's in good spirits after undergoing a three-hour abdominal surgery. Now he's awakened. He's uh, fine. Reportedly, there were no complications during the procedure to remove scar tissue and repair a hernia. He's expected to stay in hospital for several days. Doctors said the 86-year-old even managed to crack a joke when he woke up from general anesthetic. And more rescues are unfolding in southern Ukraine tonight after the destruction of a major dam unleashed rising floodwaters. It could take weeks for the water to recede. And as Briar Stewart shows us, the expectation is this crisis will only deepen. In the city of Kherson, residents who've lived through war for more than a year now have to be rescued by boat. <laughs> we have become used to the shelling, said this woman. But a natural disaster like this is a nightmare. Animals are stranded too, surrounded by floodwaters, tainted with whatever has been swept up. Thousands of houses. This MP could smell fuel while down at the Dnipro River. Hundreds of tons of engine oil with the bodies of dead animals. All of this is moving to the Black Sea. Officials say it could take a week for the water to recede, much longer to get a true sense of the environmental damage. These images show dead fish at the drained bottom of the dam's reservoir. Ukraine says that hundreds of thousands of people have been left without drinking water. This official says they will bring it in by train and by car. The defense ministry released this video of a drone apparently dropping off water too. Satellite images show that the Nova Kahovka Dam had recently sustained structural damage even before it burst. The dam was under control by Russian forces, and so were communities on the south side of the Dnipro River. This man's house is now filled with the putrid mix of water and sewage. There's no help from the authorities, he says, so he'll be left cleaning up on his own. The war can't go on forever. It must end sometime, he says. We're staying here for now. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan spoke with both the President of Ukraine and the President of Russia. In his phone call with Vladimir Putin, he reportedly said that there needs to be an international investigation into the dam's destruction, and it could include the UN. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. As thick smoke from wildfire spreads across this country, health experts urge people to protect themselves. What you do is you put it over your face. Up next, what you can do to stay safe. And Dr. Gupta is back to answer your questions. Actor Elliot Page on fame after transition. That was an instance where I felt this just sort of certain flutter of anxiety. Perhaps. A Canadian exclusive. And Prince Harry back in court. Harry, Harry. Why he says he is convinced his phone was hacked. We're back in two. Well, this soup is our top story tonight. A thick cloud of wildfire smoke enveloping huge swaths of Quebec, Ontario, 
in the U.S. Northeast. Environment Canada warns the air quality is poor for millions. So that brings with it some serious health concerns, especially for anyone with lung or heart diseases or anyone who is very young or old. But many others are feeling the effects too. So we asked Lauren Pelly to show us some tips on how to stay safe. The scene in New York, apocalyptic. In Kingston, Ontario, putrid air. And in Toronto, the skyline is mostly smog. People here are feeling the burn. Most noticeable to me is my eyes are watering and, they, and they're and they stinging. Kind of feeling it in the throat a bit, a um, little in the lungs. Um, I am slightly asthmatic, so that's why I'm wearing the mask today. So what's the best way to protect yourself from toxic smoke? Air quality experts suggest taking cues from pandemic precautions. The same kind of filter people might have bought to remove COVID, you know, from, from indoor spaces. Uh, would be very effective at removing um, the particulate air pollution from forest fires. Those filters work best while you keep the windows closed to keep smoke particles out. If you have a large family room where most people are going together, maybe after dinner, then also place a portable air cleaner there. Experts say if you have to leave the house, keep it brief. You may still go outside for a walk, but avoid exertion. And if you need to work or commute outside for longer periods of time, this respiratory therapist says it is recommended that you protect yourself as much as possible in terms of the air that you're breathing that means wearing a good quality mask ideally an n95 so walk me through we asked for a refresh on how to wear one what you do is you put it over your face depending on the style of mask put the straps over your ears or in this case behind your head Tighten around your nose and check for any leaks. Make sure it's a really good tight seal. It's not a perfect solution to the smog. But it does help protect um, you from being exposed um, in, in that environment. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Dr. Samir Gupta is back again, this time to answer your questions. So Dr. Gupta, when it comes to a sunburn, for example, we, we know now to check out the UV index. What do we do with smoke? What, what are the numbers we should be looking for? Or is it just a matter of instinct? Yeah, this is really important because this is something that's been around for a while, but we're only sort of talking about it and hearing about it now. It's something called the Air Quality Health Index. And that is similar to the UV index. It'll give you a numerical sense of how bad the air is out there. And this is something you can see on your weather forecast. It'll tell you what that AQHI is right now, later on in the day, and even forecast it ahead. And you're looking for that number anywhere from one to 10. One to three is in the low range, four to six is moderate, seven and higher is the high risk range, mm -hmm. and that's where we are at in this part of the country and in the northeastern United States right now. And that's where you start seriously moderating your behavior. Definitely, particularly if you have an underlying lung condition. And what about, what about mass in terms of children? Because, if, you know, we all know from COVID, you know, toddlers and infants and N95s don't exactly mix very well. What, what are you supposed to do to protect them? Yeah, it's tough. You know, I, I think partly with COVID, a lot of kids got used to masks and kids adapt really well to things. But yes, you can't get an N95 for children. You, you often can't get a well-fitting mask for children. You try your best with that. But ultimately, you just have to limit the amount of time that they're outdoors. Outdoors is where the risk is. Indoors is where the air is filtered. It's safer. And we do worry about the developing brain, about the developing lungs. This pollution has impact on children. Okay, so that was a question we had from a woman named Samantha. We have another one um, uh, from someone named David Wood. So th the thing is, that people in, in Alberta and parts of Canada, like Nova Scotia, know, know a lot about the dangers of smoke from wildfires. For some, in this area in particular, it's not all that common. So David wants to know about the dangers of the smoke. And he says, have there been any comparisons done between time exposure to smoke versus the number of cigarettes a person might smoke in a day? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. It's not, I would say it's not a scientific direct comparison, but if you look at those particles, that particulate matter 2.5, those tiny particles, the impact of those particles from cigarette smoking versus from pollution, you can make some type of comparison there. And what we're dealing with right now is probably in the range of a third to a half pack of cigarettes. So spending the whole day outside, 24 hours in this pollution is equivalent to that seven to 10 cigarettes range. That's astonishing. Dr. Gupta, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure.
Actor Elliot Page took a deeply personal step and put it into the spotlight. Who's Victor? I am. In his first Canadian interview since transitioning, he tells me about his life now as a trans man. In just so many ways, just healthier and more vibrant and joyful. And the risks he still faces. People threaten my life on the street. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Okay, I have the first box of Page Boy. <laughs> wow, it's real. <laughs> Did you catch the title of that book, Elliot Page, so carefully unboxed? Page Boy, clever name for a brave and open memoir from the Nova Scotia. You know Page, nominated for an Oscar for Juno back in the day, starring in the superhero series Umbrella Academy right now, and he's a trans man. He sat down with us for his first Canadian interview since transitioning. And what a transition in so many ways to finally be in a place where I wake up and I feel in my body and I'm present and don't have the sensation of wanting to flee or lift out of myself or cause myself pain. It's been extraordinary. I, I didn't think I'd ever feel this way in my life. He did it. Elliot Page says he finally found a way to be himself. This moment is a lot to talk about. So we grabbed a little time in Toronto as he was in the last days of shooting Umbrella Academy nearby. And if you haven't seen that show yet, hang on. It's a comic book come alive, a family of adopted siblings with superpowers. Umbrella Academy is funny and colorful and bold, and Elliot Page stars as Victor. Only Victor wasn't known as Victor until season three, episode two. Mm. Love the haircut. It's a pretty beautiful thing to watch that episode of Umbrella Academy, oh. where Victor announces himself as Victor, and the family are sitting, I, I don't know why I'm telling you, you were literally in the scene. Yeah, well, somebody had to do something. Who elected you, Vanya? It's uh, Victor. Who's Victor? I am. It's who I've always been. And there's like a, a moment where it sinks in and then they just move on. Uh, is that an issue for anyone? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good with it. Yeah, me too. Cool. I think that conversation is the dream of every kid when, when you fantasize coming out, you just want people to go, okay, and move on. Did, did you write that? Did you, like, where's your hand in that conversation? Well, there was definitely a collaboration and Steve Blackman, who's the showrunner of Umbrella, was so wonderful and completely embraced me when I called him to mm -hmm. tell him what I was going through and probably in many ways was one of the person first people I came up to because I had, the show was coming up and I was hoping to maybe get surgery and you know, right. all of these things. And he was really actually the one who was like, no, I want to put it in the show and I want to do it now. Truly happy for you, Victor. Well, last time I checked, you don't speak for this family. Okay, well, it's was it fun, that scene? It was fun, it, was, it did actually feel quite intense shooting it. I think maybe because I just sort of just done that in my life, and there's all these people around. Like, I don't usually feel embarrassed or shy acting. It's one of the fun things about it. It's like, it really lets you work through a lot of your embarrassment. I've done a <laughs> lot of stuff in front of like a giant room yeah. of people. But that was an instance where I felt this, just sort of certain flutter of anxiety, perhaps just because it was so personally connected at that time. Don't begrudge him the butterflies. He only announced publicly in December of 2020 that he was a trans man, living as he always knew himself to be. 
Look for images of his work before. You will find those, but you won't find the name he previously used. Every credit now changed to read Elliot, right from the productions as a little kid growing up in Nova Scotia, acting on CBC's Pit Pony. That was my first acting gig at 10 years old, Maggie McLean on Pit Pony. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what that little guy was like who played Maggie at the time? <laughs> He was, oh gosh, that was actually, it, it was an interesting time um, doing that film because I feel like I was sort of getting to really kind of look like myself and um, have, uh, you know, my appearance match how I was feeling inside and, uh, and was th absolutely thrilled to, to get that part and embark on the journey of, of being an actor, the, the feeling of it, everything it offered me, the people I met, how much it expanded my world. But it came with a, an interesting uh, uh, counterpoint, which was, you know, playing these, you know, girl characters, uh, which obviously then continued and continued and continued. And um, I think, you know, then, then shifted how I was feeling or how I could look. So at, at 10 in your everyday life, you were who you were, Yeah. right? Do you think that you had the words to know that you were a boy or just the feeling? Mostly the feeling. And so the feeling was I was just like absolutely perplexed, especially as I started to come to terms with more that I wasn't, you know? Like I just was actually baffled. Like I couldn't wrap my head around it. I think it actually was something I was consistently expressing to a degree, you know? This is what I feel like. Can I be this when I grow up, et cetera, et cetera. But like, can I be a boy when I grow up? Yes, mm -hmm. but I had no language for what that meant at the time. I think some people who will, who will be watching this may remember seeing you, I mean, not that long ago when you spoke to Oprah. Right? Mm, and yeah. the transition was very fresh. And as a viewer, it seemed pretty, pretty raw, especially when you were talking about things that made you joyful. It's the little, it's, you know, getting out of the shower and the towels around your waist and you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're just like, there I am. It's been a little bit of time. Are you still having these sort of discoveries that make you happy, you know? Absolutely, I mean, every day when I wake up in the morning or and stretch my body and go for a walk. It's hard to know how to describe it, but when you've spent so much time thinking you could never feel a certain way, a level of discomfort that I could never shake and did and did, didn't understand why, especially with how fortunate I am, the privilege that I have, and to finally be in a place where I wake up and I feel in my body and I'm present and don't have the sensation of wanting to flee or lift out of myself or cause myself pain. Um, it's been extraordinary. I, I didn't think I'd ever feel this way in my life. What Elliot Page has always done is be willing to lend his voice to issues that need help. I just admire all those who have been here on the front line protecting the wetland. Making a documentary about tainted water in Canada, fighting for the protection of the trans and larger LGBTQ communities. It's Elliot Page here. I just spent an hour taking the U.S. train survey, and I'm popping on video to ask you to take it too. He's quick to talk of being grateful for what he has, but in the opening pages of his memoir, he adds another word to how he's feeling right now, terrified. There will be people who can't relate to your experience, right, who, who haven't had to go through this at all, who will say, come on, like, where's the threat? Can you help them understand what being afraid looks like? Yeah, well, I'm afraid, you know, I had a cold beer thrown on me and called a faggot walking down the street around the corner, you know? It's like I've had people threaten my life on the street, and this is just neat. This is like this person you see on TV, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. let alone um, 
people who are more vulnerable than me and what they can deal with literally on a day-to-day -day basis or a fear every time they just walk out of their house or what have you. Um, and hate crimes are up. You know, murders of trans women of color are just constant and horrific. Um, rise in suicide rates. I wish people did understand more the reality of what the community faces. Trans people just want to live, just want to be able to be who they are authentically, access the health care they need to survive and thrive, but it's getting turned into this and has always been so highly politicized and used by politicians as, as a weapon, essentially. It absolutely does manifest in the real world, in schools and when you're walking down the street. What did you do when that beer was thrown in your head? Oof. I spun around and screamed my head off at them. Yeah, don't know if that was necessarily the right choice, but that was the reaction I had. In the book, you do write about some of these things, and one moment that struck me was when you were playing soccer in Nova Scotia, and you felt brave enough and bold enough in a moment to tell someone you trusted on the team that you thought maybe you were bisexual. What happened? We were sharing a room in like a dorm, like at a soccer tournament. And I mean, she just laughed and was like, no, you're not, you know. Um, and, but that's, was not, it's not surprising at the time, you know, Nova Scotia in, what year would that have been, 2002? If it did come up in school in like health class or something, you know, everyone would be giggling and laughing. All the jokes you saw on TV, it's not shocking, but you know, that was probably the first time I tried to express something and the second time would have been to my mother and that was, bless her. Uh, How did that go? <laughs> not well, it did not go well. Um, yeah, we were just in the car and I was like, Mom, I think, I think I was around the same age, maybe like 15, about to turn 16 or something around there. And I just was like, Mom, I think I might be gay. Or, and she just was like, she just snapped. I think there was some, because I don't think she even belie believed this at the time. Like, she knew people who were gay. Like, I knew of maybe one person in her life she knew was gay and she just yelled, that doesn't exist. So I just was like, okie doke, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Interactions like the one with your mom and the one with your friend, I would imagine shut you down a bit because that's brave to say those things out loud and then to get shut down really stings. And, and did that sort of delay your transition? Um, well, what it delayed for sure was just me like not wanting to embrace like my my queerness and right? I then pretty much didn't talk about it I'm sure ultimately that all that lingering or those initial responses conscious or not were affecting mm -hmm. my ability to step into my trans identity and I would try and just constantly talk myself out of it Oh, you just need to le learn to be comfortable. You just need the tighter sports bra. You just need this, and you just cut your hair this way, and it'll be fine. And da 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 da. And it's like trying, you know, like. But thank gosh, uh, I got I got here. I feel so lucky, and I know I'm still young, but I certainly wish it happened a bit earlier. But. Um, I'm just so grateful to be here now. And when I did tell my mom, she just was so supportive. And I think for her too, she saw me, um, sorry, she saw me struggle so much. And so I think in many ways, she felt relief, just relief to see that her kid was happy and embodied and in just so many ways just healthier and more vibrant and joyful. And still a kid. Yeah, still a kid. 
puberty all over again. <laughs> Lucky her. Joke's on me. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a, a copy of the book that was an electronic copy of the book, so you can search certain things. And the word shame and the word joy, they're almost tied for how often they appear in the book. And I, I wonder how you have kicked shame to the curb, or does it s sort of lurk around the margins? Oh gosh, I'm, I'm sure it's still lurking somewhere. <laughs> uh, but no, I feel so much more liberated in that regard. I think that's the feeling. And, and, in, and in so many ways, and life feels like new in so many ways because I'm not, I'm not letting that like virus and mm -hmm. like infect my head. You know? that, like, that is I, impressive. I'm proud and, and, and stoked to be who I am. And even in moments when it's, you know, challenging and difficult, I would not, I would not change this for a second. Thanks so much, Elliot. Thank you. Really appreciate talking to Thank you. So what now for Elliot? He says maybe he will get to play some of the male roles he's always wanted to, maybe more documentaries, some directing. He has choices that he says he never felt like he had before. Next, Prince Harry takes the stand in a phone hacking case. What he said in his second day of testimony. Next. Prince Harry's two days of testimony are now over. He was cross-examined for hours again today as part of a legal battle against the British tabloids. Chris Brown now with his unprecedented court appearance. The prince, who claims he has endured unending and much of it illegal media scrutiny since he was a child, is trying to convince a judge to hold a British newspaper publisher accountable. Harry was cross-examined for the second straight day in a series of combative exchanges with lawyers for the Mirror Group newspapers. The company has previously settled 600 claims for illegally intercepting voicemails, but says Harry was never hacked. In court, both sides sparred over a selection of 33 stories, many focusing on Harry's relationship with a former girlfriend, Chelsea Davey. He claimed a private investigator put a tracking device on their car. A newspaper reports that he went drinking at a club after being dumped had to have originated from hacked phone calls. The Mirror lawyers say that's just speculation. Under cross-examination, Harry was asked to point to any specific voicemail that he knows with certainty was hacked. He couldn't, instead saying there is only hard evidence of suspiciousness that many were. I think we've seen a lack of detail, perhaps. Media lawyer Antonia Foster says a major challenge is that many of the calls or voice messages are now irretrievable. I mean, they go back to 1996, and so, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you what was on my phone a year ago, and I, I suspect Harry's in, in that particular situation. Much will depend on how the journalists who wrote the stories explain themselves. Jane Kerr, a former Mirror Royal editor, testified immediately after Harry while he stayed in court to listen. She says she didn't know how a private investigator obtained phone numbers, and she never asked him. Harry was on the stand for eight hours in total over the two days. He testified if the decision, which is still weeks away, goes against him, it would be an injustice. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Soccer superstar Lionel Messi has a new team. He's going to Inter Miami and joining Major League Soccer. It comes after he left Paris Saint-Germain. The move is somewhat of a surprise. He reportedly had offers from Saudi Arabia and Barcelona. Messi's move is being seen as a big boost to U.S. soccer. Next, the car troubles your mechanic cannot fix. So I opened the hood, look inside, and then I'm just shocked. The curious creature that forced this driver to pull over in our moment. So what's that cute little noise? That is the sound of a marmot in the engine. You heard that. The sizable critter crawled right in there while Vincent Bouchard and his daughters were just hiking in Jasper National Park. So on their way back to Edmonton, the dashboard lit up with warnings, with all the warnings. They stopped, they checked under the hood, and there they found the large rodent just staring up at them. The marmot who moved in is our moment.
get in the car, um, start driving, and then all kinds of lights start flashing on my dashboard, like transmission, ABS. So I open the hood, look inside, and then I'm just shocked. There was a big marmot right there on my engine, just looking at me, seemed perfectly happy. I just start laughing. So I go get a branch and, you know, try to poke it because I expect it to just run away. And then it just went and hid under the engine. He calls uh, the wildlife conflict specialist, pulls like really, really hard, takes the marmot out of the car. Uh, it's not happy. Marmot is not happy, but he put it in the cage. She seems fine, not burned uh, or anything. Then uh, we start driving again and the lights are still flashing. And indeed, the marmot had chewed a wire that connected to something, I don't know. Everything is fine in the end, my car seems to be fine. The marmot's gonna be fine, but it's just like, it's so unexpected. I really did not expect to find a marmot under my hood. Well, he, he's a very good sport. They drove for some nine kilometers with all that happening. And when they stopped and, and realized what it was, they tried to use a sandwich to sort of get the marmot out. You know, here, marmot sandwich. It wasn't biting. I guess it had eaten all the cables and was more than happy. That is a national for June the 7th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.